Okay. Yeah, so I made available some notes on forces and Newton's laws of motion. Was anybody able to see it? Uh, it was only today, I think. No, or, or maybe a few days ago. I can't remember. Yeah. So um, we want to discuss this a little. Most of it is in the notes, if not all. Um, a lot of things that you know Newton observed and eventually compiled them or summarize them into what we now refer to as his laws of motion were really common, common knowledge. It was just that he took the time to uh, put them in writing and to do a mathematical treatment of these observations that you and I um, Wait, I gotta pause this thing. Somebody is telling me somebody is telling me. All right, yeah, let's go ahead with our discussion. Eh? Yeah, so as I said, um, most of the observations that uh, Isaac Newton made about forces and uh, motion and so were not new observations really. The only difference with him is that he took the time to um, do some writing, there's one, and he actually did a mathematical treatment of, you know, the interaction of forces as well as the motion of bodies, right? Uh, Speaking of forces, there's a nice definition of what a force really is. In the notes, they talk about push or a pull. Uh, it can be contact, uh, where one object is in contact with the other. You know, let's say that the pushing is happening or the pulling. Or it can have non-contact forces and so on, right? Um, well, let's let's analyze the laws. There are lots of related concepts or ideas that um, you will have to get a little clearer. But um, we're going to we're going to talk about them a little. As we go along, right? So this is this force law. Uh, everybody can see this, right? Is it big enough? Yes, sir. Yeah. So one of the first thing you observe about bodies at rest and bodies in motion was that, as it says here, object, it could remain in a state of rest. Now let's take that part, right? unless it's compelled to change that state by a net force. So all of that needs some explanation, you know, which we have to. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's take something, you know, maybe there is an object. Let's say this is like a tabletop, and you have an object here, you know? So everybody knows this. That's what I'm saying. This is nothing new to man talked about. If you have, have an object on a tabletop there, right? Let's say this is here, you know? It keeps on the table, let's say. It's not going to move unless, and sometimes you, you are yourself, your children or your, your husband or wife, you put something somewhere and it's not there anymore. What do you tell them? You say, it couldn't move 
move unless somebody moved it. Right? So that's what I'm saying. His first law was common knowledge. Right? Common knowledge. So if that thing is on the tabletop, right? And nobody moves it, or there's not a, well, it's not about a net force. A net force doesn't act like, I'm going to explain this in, in a little more detail, right? Unless a net force acts in it, it's not going to move. Because there are a lot of forces that can very well come into play here. For example, there's the force of weight. The book would have a weight, right, acting down. And this is a type of force. If you do your reading in the notes, they're going to talk about weight. Weight is really the mass multiplied by acceleration due to gravity. So there is a force acting. But it says a net force. So is there some other force that is counteracting this force? Yes. Right? Uh, the force of reaction, the table's reaction. Right? So the table is reacting to the weight. And notice I put, okay, the reaction is acting from the top of the table toward the, the object. But you notice I put the weight in the middle here. Uh, really and truly, the weight of this object, bits of it is exerted all over the object. But for simplicity and for calculation purposes, we think of the weight that is acting through the center of mass of the object, right? Going vertically down, right? It's, it's something we do in physics, just to, it's, it's as though we are letting this infinitely small point represent the entire object, right? And not only this, um, I don't know again, if you ever, you, you're on the, you, you see an object, and you take your hand and maybe give it a little, let's say you give it a little nudge, you know? You give it a little nudge. Um, you give it a little nudge and let's call this, let's say you give it a push. But sometimes, in this, in this force especially is very small, right? Does the object move if, it, if the force here is very small? Have you ever, I mean, think about it. I mean, right where you're sitting at home there. Take an object, put it on a surface, and give it a very small force. Give it very, it, sometimes it doesn't move, right? It doesn't move. But then, but, but there is a net force, it seems like, right? If you're, if, okay, the weight is canceled by your reaction, you know, the two of them are equal opposite. Now that you have exerted a small force here, the book was supposed to move according to this. No. But the reason why it's not going to move is because when you start to exert a pressure here or a small force, there's another force that is acting this way. And you call that frictional force. It's a resistive force. And frictional force, again, please do your reading in the notes. It's really the force that opposes relative motion, right? It's that force that is acting against speed so that the body doesn't move, right? And what happens is as you increase speed, as P increases, right? As P increases, so does F. F increases as well, right? And it becomes what you call the limiting friction force. Limiting frictional force. Right? Limiting friction. I'm not going to write it all over. Again, so so it, it goes to a maximum. So as you, as you start to exert some force on this object, there's a little book on the table or what? The frictional force starts to increase as well, right? And it comes a point, it comes a point where um, P 
right, becomes just equal to or greater than f, right? And what happens then, the book is now in what we call equilibrium. And any increase of p greater than f, the book will start to slide. Right, and it goes for every object. I'm just using book as an example. However, I don't know if you've done this before, but once the book start to move, you know, if you're sliding something along, at first it seemed hard to start sliding. Right, I don't know if you all ever observed that. It starts to, you know, it's hard to get sliding. Once it starts to slide, it seems to slide with ease. What usually happens is the frictional force Right, and I'm going to probably put, uh, uh, yeah, everything frictional force is going to be R. I use a max in the text, but you put a max on top, right? What usually happens is that the force, the frictional force gets a little less once the body starts to move, right? And usually, okay. By the way, there's a, there's a relationship. F is equals to mu R, right? Uh, the frictional force is equals to mu. Mu is what we call the, let me see if I can pop this slide. Uh, mu is the coefficient of friction. Right? Um, and mu will have two values, right? They have what you call static coefficient of friction. And what is Orwin Crandon trying to do? And dynamic, dynamic coefficient of friction. And usually, this coefficient is slightly higher than the dynamic. The static is slightly higher than the dynamic. Right? As I said, when you when you try to uh, push the book along on the table, the for the frictional force will climb in, in value or size and goes to a maximum value, right? And that's to calculate that maximum value, you use the static coefficient of friction in this formula. R is the, the, the reaction of the field, right? And the dynamic coefficient of friction is a little less, right? It's a little less. And that explains why when you push some an object along, I know, I don't know if you look, look at if you push a car. To get the car rolling is hard, but once the car starts to roll, you can, you, you know, sometimes I do that. Somebody's trying to push a car. So I say, my guys, once you start, they come in there, man. And when, there's, when the car starts to roll, I put my hand and they say, I'll left it, left it, I'm going to push it. And me alone push the car. And then I say, how you, how you don't going to push this car in five, but we couldn't do it. Yeah, you don't tell them the trick, right? The dynamic coefficient of friction is, is much less than the static coefficient of friction. To get the thing moving is harder, but once you get it moving, right? Once you get it moving, and it's very easy to, to move along, right? Well, so let's get back to the law, right? So you're saying that an object at rest is going to remain there at rest, right? Uh, unless a net, notice what we mean by net. If P is equal to F, we still don't have a net force acting on it, right? P has to, ex um, to exceed F before, uh, before that happens, right? Good. I'm going to um, 
so many things mixed up in this one lot of time. Yes, and remind me to talk about friction a little more when I leave off this one, right? Uh, let's talk about the other part of the law, where it says that an object now in a state of motion at a constant velocity, right, is going to continue like that unless, again, acted upon by a net force. Now, I was, I was thinking all along the week, how was it that Isaac Newton was able to verify this? What phenomenon, what observation, uh, you know, can he point to? to verify what he's saying. You all understand what the thing is saying? When it, when it says, a body is going to continue at a constant speed unless a, a net force acts on it. And that's why it's going to slow it down or speed it up. Right? So if a net force acts on it, it can either slow it down or speed it up. Uh, could you, uh, let, let me just throw it out at you if anybody is thinking in the class. Could you think of a situation where that I, Isaac Newton can look at to, to kind of point to as evidence of this part of the law? Anybody can think of an idea? Because a lot of times now, uh, they would point to things moving in a vacuum. They would talk about space. And really and truly in space, there are so many forces out there acting on things, right? Nothing really travels, um, you know, in straight lines in space. Everything actually is moving at big curves, right? Because there's always a large body pulling the thing into a, a circle, right? And definitely he couldn't point to that because he didn't know about what's going on out there, right? Um, they only they only knew they knew that the things definitely bodies are going around in circles. Uh, what do you think he pointed to? You think he pointed to anything? What I'm thinking is that sometimes you don't have to point to, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you'll understand this reasoning. People might want a direct proof, but sometimes you could show people that, you know, something, if a body is moving, what makes it slow down? So let's say, okay. Uh, an object is sliding across uh, a surface. You know, what makes it stop? Now that we've spoken about friction and all of that, what makes it stop? Huh? Sorry, the friction? Yeah. So that's an external force, right? That is acting on the body. It's a net force acting against that body moving at a constant speed, right? So sometimes while we might be thinking that he has to produce direct evidence, he can produce evidence that look what happens when a force is acting. It slows the body down. And he is inferring then that if a force is what slows the body down, in the absence of a force, and I'm leaving all the word net every time, right? In the absence of a net force, that body would have continued moving. And perhaps he can, he can use something, a body gliding over ice, 
And you can say, look, the frictional force on ice is so small, it's negligible. This thing will continue to move. You, you, just, you just take a little object and you, you know, skid it across the ice and you can cross the whole river, the frozen river or the lake or what. Nothing will stop it. The only thing would stop it, right? Is if there was some kind of force. And that's what he used, you know, these. Um, sometimes he's pointing to the fact that, okay, it will only slow down because of friction acting against it, right? And similarly, you would say that if an object is moving at a particular speed, for it to speed up, right? So you have something that's moving at a constant speed. So whatever forces are at work, it just balances out the friction of force and it's moving at a constant speed. The only way you can get it to speed up is if you were to exert a net force, right? So sometimes it's not that he has to show a direct, he can show indirect evidence. Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking, how is it that he could get something to move with constant speed uh, in his day and age? He, he couldn't. Right? He couldn't. Right? There's always forces acting on the thing, right? Um, it was a difficult piece of the law. Right? I want to think that he could get an object maybe rolling on a surface, going at constant speed, right? And and what he's going to say is, okay, this thing is going to only speed up if I exert a force, right? And like like the, the object gliding across the ice, and so it's only going to slow down if there is some kind of force slowing it down, like friction, right? Um, your practical lecturer, uh, Mr. Formala, contact him to me. And he should be doing an experiment on especially friction, right? Where, okay, if I were to deviate from the law a little, right? And uh, so we're talking about the frictional force is equal to mu r, right? And Okay, if you want to use a zero here for uh, static friction, right? And just that equal mu r for dynamic friction, right? Dynamic. And uh, I think there's a little experiment where you put something on an inclined plane. Uh, so you put something here, and um, okay, the mass mg acting down the, the weight. This way, I think is mg plus theta. That's a theta. Theta is this, one. and the force acting down is f. What am I saying? Mg, Mg sine theta, Mg sine theta. And the frictional force that way, right? The reaction force is there in this, right? So there is an experiment. I don't know if he's going to do it, but I advise him to do it. Where you can calculate the coefficient of friction mu, mu, right? Uh, is equal to, I think, is the tan of theta. Right? I think it's the tan of theta. And, and please, if you can do some geometry and prove that to yourself, right? So the uh, I should say mu zero, the coefficient of static friction, right? Or the, the limiting friction. You know, that that the maximum frictional force that will hold this thing from sliding down. The coefficient of the limiting static friction is given by tan of theta. And you all can actually do the uh, the 
There will be a geometry to prove that, right? So um, I don't know if he's going to do this experiment, but I remember doing it. There are other ways. You can actually take the object and drag it along a surface, right? And measure the force that will actually get it going, right? Get it moving. But this is a very simple one where you use an inclined plane and you increase this angle to the point where this thing slides down. Just when it slides down, you take the angle and the turn of the angle is the uh, coefficient of static friction. Or I think the, the word is limiting friction. Right? Limiting friction. Good. I want to go to that second law. Yeah. So you can see this. Is, is it big enough? Is the right end big enough? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and, and different textbook will treat this. Uh, or or state this law very different. And what this law is, is really saying, it is okay. The force law got to do with something that is either at rest or it's moving at a constant speed. So Newton now decides to go a little further. What if I want to get something moving where I exert a net force on it? What now? You know, can I now describe the mathematics of its motion, right? Uh, or if something is moving at a certain speed and I want to slow it down or I want to speed it up, how can I describe the mathematics connecting the force and the motion of this body? And that is what he did in this law, right? He said that, what did he say? He said when a net external force, right? So there's a net force now. For us, there was no net force. Acts on an object of mass m. The acceleration that results is directly proportional uh, Okay, okay. I, I think, yeah, this, this is how he said it. That the acceleration is directly proportional to the force and is inversely proportional to the mass. That's that's one way. Some people like to say that the, the force is proportional to the mass times the acceleration, right? And you would notice that they use the word proportional, but I'm seeing an equal sign, right? But really and truly. The original, uh, the original statement of his law is supposed to be like this. F is proportional to the mass by the acceleration. Right? And you all know in mathematics that for you to replace this, you have to have a constant of proportionality introduced. However, we see none here. This doesn't exist. We have straight away F equal MP. Right? And um, is, is born in the class? Born here in the class? Let's see. Oh, born is in the class. Oh, uh, born was he there at, uh, what do you call it, sports? 
Miswani Wayer Born. He he um he's an officiator or something like sport. I don't know about that, sir. <laughs> I wanted them to, to get his take on how what they did with the key. Right? But what happened is that um, they defined, and this was a real stroke of genius. In order to get rid of that key and just have F equal M E, what happened? They defined mass, right, in such a way. It's not mass really, they're defining Newton. They're defining Newton as the force that will produce on a mass of one kilogram an acceleration of one meter per second squared. Right? So in that case, you can put in one, 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 and K becomes one. Right? So the, the formula now becomes F equal M. I don't know if you all get that. They defined the Newton in a way that makes K1. They said that one Newton is equal to the force that will produce on a mass of one kilogram an acceleration of one meter per second squared. And by doing that, you, you, actually eliminate K because K happens now to be one. Right? And we end up with the formula F equal M. And this formula now, um, you can use now to calculate um, the acceleration that is produced by a particular force. Right? Once once you can um, once you can uh, work out what the net force acting on a body, well, you can now calculate the acceleration. And of course, the other way around, you can, there are three things in the form. There are times when you can be given the acceleration and you have to find the force. You're given the mass and you have to find other things. So we're going to work examples, right? I'm going to probably uh, take tomorrow afternoon if this guy doesn't want to. Uh, if he doesn't want to do any laps tomorrow, I'll talk about it in just a moment. And we'll work a few examples that in, involve um, all three laws, right? All three laws. Good. So that's the second law. And the third law, the third law, Oh, this is what the third law is saying. It's saying that whenever one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts an opposite, well, let me use fancy words here, an oppositely directed force of equal magnitude on the force on it, right? Different textbooks will state this very differently, but they will carry the same idea, right? Just like we had earlier. Uh, well, that, that was meant to be a flat surface. You have a book there and it has a certain weight, mg. The, the table is going to react with an equal force, so R equal m. Right? Maybe, maybe tension force can come into place now. Okay. So you have maybe something is pulling something, right? So let's just say it's a car or something, right? Pulling something away. Right? So 
there is a certain force pulling here, and there is a certain force pulling here because this, okay, they're all in it, right? This particular body, if this body is pulling this body, right, then this body will exert this force, right, on this one. And based on this law, this body is going to exert a force that is equal to this force this way on this body. Right? You all follow that? So these are what we call tension forces. There is going to be a force tugging at this object from this object, and there's going to be a force tugging on this object by this object. Right? And that's why you see uh, two tensions here. This one is actually pulling this way, and it's exhorted by this one. And this one is exhorted by this one, right? Uh, and it's pulling at this one. Right? I hope I get that right. So it can be confusing. And these, these things can actually help us when it comes to solving problems involving the tree laws, right? But, so you will find that in problems involving the various uh, forces, right? right? The, the, the laws of motion. You would find a lot of uh, a talk of a lot of different forces. Like, like I think we mentioned some. Maybe I should just capture them back quickly. Right? We talked about weight, weight being the mass by gravity. Right? And, and related to that G, right? This is what we call the uh, <coughs> The acceleration, acceleration due to gravity, right? And if you if you actually watch this here, this is actually F equal to anything. What weight is a force, it's equal to mass by right? G, which is an acceleration, right? And sometimes they refer to G as what you call, uh, I think they call it the, the gravitational field strength and all of that. Right? We talked about friction, friction, right? Um, static and dynamic, right? F equal mu R, right? Mu zero is the limiting coefficient. Of friction, right? And once it gets moving, it's just you are right. So then they have another subscript here, right? So you see, I use S here and B here, you know, that sort of thing to distinguish it. And usually, mu uh, S is a little greater than mu D, right? And then you will hear of some other forces. We talked about reaction, reaction forces. Right? Uh, so, if, okay, you have something and maybe a, let's say a ladder leaning on a wall. If the wall is smooth, the reaction is going to be directly perpendicular. Right? If the if the ground there is is it has friction, which is usually the case, it has friction, right? So you're gonna have a reaction, and you're going to have frictional force going this way, and there is going to be a resultant, right? Uh, what would I call this? I don't want to use a bit. I'm very call it P. Right, this is your reaction, right? Calls R1, R2, frictional force, and P 
is the resultant of those things. So sometimes reaction forces can get very complicated too, right? Uh, And there's something that, that is very related to Newton's laws and something we call equilibrium. Equilibrium. It's a, it's a term that will come up ever so often. And equilibrium basically um, is, is a state where there are no net forces. Right, there are no net forces acting on a body. Right, you can have you can have what you call again static. Uh, give me a second. Static equilibrium, and you can have dynamic dynamic equilibrium. Right. And um, when you speak of static equilibrium, is usually when the body is at rest. Body at rest. And net force, net force equals zero. And dynamic equilibrium is body in motion. And yet the net force is equal to zero, right? So um, there's a little more to equilibrium, but let, let me just explain this. Here. So body can be at rest. We talked about when we were discussing the force law, we talked at length about the body just resting there. The net force is zero. And because there's no net force acting on the body and it's not moving, it's in static equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium is when the body is actually moving, right? And it's related to that force law where it's actually moving. And it's not accelerating, it's just moving at a constant speed, right? As I said, it's a very difficult thing to see in the everyday life, you know, because uh, very often, uh, you know, you, are, you can hardly have a situation where you, you can control the dynamics of a moving body where there is no net force moving, right? Uh, maybe on your, when you're driving with your car and you're moving at a constant speed, it's, it's difficult, right? I don't know when you're all driving. Do you can you maintain a constant, constant speed? The drivers in the class? Is it easy to do that? No, sir. You saying yes or, or no? No. You say yes or no, Martin? Sorry, I said no. Yeah, it's a difficult thing because however you can achieve it, right? Um where uh, maybe you're driving your car and you're exerting, you, you know, you're pressing the accelerator just enough where you reach a certain speed and you maintain that one speed, right? That's where all the frictional force on the wheel, the wind, you know, the, 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 um, the amount of force that is needed to move the vehicle forward is just what the engine is producing. Very, very difficult to achieve. But that's dynamic equilibrium, where you are moving, let's say you're driving at 50, it's the speed limit and you're driving just there. You know how it's difficult, right? And that's why I'm saying that I, I'm, I'm really thinking of, and, and if, you, if you all think about it and um, can edify me the next time too, how is it that Newton could have shown this directly, right? Could have shown this directly. Um, and I'm all ears. Right? Maybe he could have used something sliding over ice. But no matter what, it does come to rest. Right? It does come to rest. Because it's very difficult to have a surface where there's virtually no friction. Right? 
and to achieve constant um, constant uh, velocity is, is very difficult, it's very difficult, right? Later on, um, there is a related idea. I don't know if you are, I think I did talk to you about something called terminal velocity. Terminal velocity. Velocity. Right? But this couldn't this couldn't be demonstrated uh, with the kind of equipment they probably had then, right? Uh, maybe yes, they could have demonstrated it with like a glass tube with some oil inside and they throw, if they throw, if, and that's if the glass tube is long enough. I don't know if they had a, a way of making it. But that's how they demonstrated today. They take a glass tube, they put oil inside and they throw in a bead, right? Like a, a some kind of rounded bead. And they measure the, the time it's taking for regular intervals. And it comes a point where the speed of that thing is constant because uh, the, the forces that are acting against the bead as it falls through the oil. Remember, oil is very viscous, right? It produces some resistance to the weight of the bead. It comes a point where the, the weight of the ball is equal to those resistive forces the viscous forces, and then we have what we call terminal velocity. I am not sure whether they had um, the kind of equipment to do such a thing, right, in his day. But that's a situation where you can get something moving at a constant velocity, right? And thus, that second part of the force law can be demonstrated, right? Um, it happens to when Men jump off from these uh, airplanes. They do skydiving. Now their 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 weight is going to make them fall at a certain speed, and then the wind from below the air is going to produce a lot of resistive forces now. And it comes a point where their weight and that resistive force is equal. So if they were moving, they're falling at a let's say a speed of I don't know. Let me say 100 meters per second. Not 100, I think that's too much. Um, let's just say, I'm going to, maybe you can research that for me. There is a rough value online, right? Uh, maybe you can Google it fast while I'm talking. So let's say they reach 60 or 80 km per hour in falling through the air. And their weight is equal to the resistive force. What will happen now, they'll keep falling at 80 km per hour until they reach ground. Right? So they've achieved terminal velocity. It's that velocity where that second part of the force law of Newton applies, where the resistive forces and their weight is equal. So there is no net force acting on them. So whatever their velocity, well, that's why they'll continue falling. I am not sure that they could have achieved these things because they didn't know air travel at the time, right? So uh, I'm still at a loss as to how he, what evidence he pointed to, direct evidence I'm talking about, to, to verify his second and his first law. Right? Yeah. Now, speaking about equilibrium. You can have a situation where it seems as though the net force is zero. Like, okay, um, y'all remember your door now, right? That's your door now. And you might exert a force here, you know, and a force there. Right? Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. So it seems here, it seems here that the upward force is F and the downward force is F. And therefore, this body should be in equilibrium. But why is this thing turning? 
If the upward force is equal to the downward force, the body is supposed to be in equilibrium. But this is an additional dimension of uh, the condition for equilibrium. Something called the moments or the turning force of all the forces involved must be equal, right? Uh, so let me, let me see if I... There's something called the moment of a force. So like, what if you have a seesaw, right? And this is your pivot here, right? And down here has a certain distance. And if a force here is acting down, the moment of F about P is FD, right? If this force by that distance. And another word for moment is turning effect, turning effect. Right? And this now factors into the condition for equilibrium. Besides that your net forces must be zero, meaning your upward force must equal to your downward force. There's that condition that your anti-clockwise moment, anti-clockwise moment. Sorry, this is clockwise, right? Your clockwise moment must be equal to your anti-clockwise moment. So when it, when it comes to equilibrium, it is not enough for you to say that the net forces, net forces equal zero, right? Um, you know, meaning the upward force is equal to the downward force, right? You're turning, you're turning, um, the turning effect, right? Turning effect also has to be zero. So there must be no net turning effect, right? So no force must produce a net turning effect. Your clockwise moment must equal to your anti-clockwise. When all of these are satisfied, well, then you have a situation that we refer to as equilibrium. Right? So I think we talked about a lot there. Uh, there is even um, something called Newton's law of gravitation. I don't know if you saw that in the next. Uh, did you Google anybody? Google a rough value for terminal velocity before I go here. Let's see how you are taking so long. We have a little thing this on. You got the internet with you. Let me ask Bing. What? is the terminal velocity of the sky diver. Let me just ask. I'll give you a moment. Let's say 195 km per hour. Oh, that's a lot, right? Yes, they got 193. Um, yeah, different, different, yeah. 60, okay. Yeah, they got all, all kinds of things, depending on his orientation, weight, lots of things. But that's that's a lot of speed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 193. Uh, another one, say. Uh, that's a rough one. There's a rough man. Yeah. All right. Mm 
Yeah. So there is there is another law that Newton came up with called the Newton's law of gravitation. Let me cut it and put it on top here. And this one was very remarkable because um, you don't really, this force that, that this law is talking about, right? Uh, it's not really measurable, at least at, it, at the time he came up with it, right? The forces were very small for bodies around us. Like they're telling you that, okay, every two object that you have around you, they're exerting a force on one, right? And it's given by the product of the two masses divided by, well, how the square of the distance apart, right? So the farther the apart they are, the less uh, will be fit, right? And the constant of proportionality that he introduced is what we call the universal gravitational constant. Uh, that's why I was asking, I was asking for Born he being the physics teacher in the class. Um, it's interesting to know how they actually calculated um, how they calculated this number, right? This this constant in that their day and age. Right? It's good to get into the history of how they were able to do it, right? Um, but this force. If you notice, it's proportional to the, the masses involved. And that would explain why, you know, the sun can be able to curl the, or keep the earth spinning around it, right? Uh, because of the massive size of the sun. And that is why I was saying that straight line motion is very rare in the universe. Everything revolving around everything, right? You know, even even those comets and so that you see when you just uh, everything. If you if they were to hurl a space a satellite into space, I say this is the sun, it's the Earth here, and the Earth was to shoot out the satellite. Let's say it has to go to Mars, right? So what they got to do? They got to actually calculate when Mars is going to pass. Let's just say here, right? They say Mars is here. And they're going to shoot out the um, thing, right? They're going to shoot it out in a curve. They're shoot it straight. If they shoot it straight, by then the, the thing reach the Mars end of it. So when they shoot it, they have to make use. They have to make use of the, the, the sun's gravitational pull. They have to factor in the Earth and the moon and all things in such a way that this thing is going to curve now and go straight there. So when Mars reach here, bam, it hit, it, 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 it reach Mars, and then they use some fuel and so for it to land on Mars, right? So they actually have to make Mars, let, let this thing actually fall in like, in the part of Mars, and then Mars is gonna do its work and pull it into them. And then they're gonna use their whatever uh, mechanism they got so that when it falls into Mars, Gravitational pull, where it's going to be able to stop and slow down and land safely and so. So you don't really have things um, going in a straight line, right? Even the, I think they sent out one time a spacecraft. I think it's it's almost near the edge of our solar system. But even that spacecraft is actually in a curve. It's always in a curve because of these huge objects pulling at them, right? When you shoot straight, then things will just pull it and run, run its own way, right? So there is a formula to, to, to tell you how much, what speed you are to give a spacecraft for it to escape or its gravitational pull and all of that to end up in space, to be orbiting, to be orbiting. That's how they will shoot it out. Don't go straight, don't think so. They shoot it out in a curve. They shoot in a curve and, and art starts to pull it and it goes round and round and round and round. 
So those slaves travel would go around the earth forever. They could go forever without fuel because the earth is what is exerting that, that uh, force on it. But it's not going in a straight line, it's going in curves. There is, um, I think when we do circular motion, I'll probably find that uh, that escape velocity, you call it. So that you actually will launch into orbit around the Earth. And if you want to break out of Earth's orbit, what speed you have to exceed, you know? But this law was very interesting. All right. So um, what we're going to do, we're going to stop there. We talked about the laws, and maybe tomorrow afternoon we have a short class because Sarah is going to start practical next week. I called him today, and he said from next week Wednesday. But he's going to he actually I sent him the link to join our group, so he's going to join the group, and you're going to get information as to when you are going to start, right? And uh, so from next week Wednesday we can't have a class. So tomorrow we'll have a short class very early, maybe from 3 30 to 4 30 the latest. Right? And we'll work a few examples that involve the laws. All right, so we'll stop here.